Schwerer Gustav, Heavy Gustav, was the largest and most powerful gun used in World War II. Commissioned by Hitler to destroy the French Maginot Line, it was actually only used extensively in the Siege of Sevastopol. Dismantled by the Germans before losing the war, this cannon was the heaviest piece of mobile artillery ever built and had the greatest caliber of any rifled weapon used in war. Although its 20,000 pound shells could break through seven meters of reinforced concrete, 500 people were needed to fire it, and about 4,000 were needed to project and operate it on the battlefield. the Maginot Line, a row of fortifications along the Franco-German border intended to divert any upcoming invasion to Belgium, which would be protected by several divisions of the French army. That way they hoped to avoid replicating the damage and destruction of World War I to French territory. The fortifications included blockhouses, rail lines, and bunkers. The barrier was extensive and comprehensive, seemingly impenetrable. Due to this, Hitler was in need of a new, powerful weapon that could do what no other existing weapon could. The Oberkommando des Heeres, the German Army High Command, reached out to the Essen weapons producer Friedrich Krupp AG to commission a gun that could take down the forts along the Maginot Line in 1934. The main requirement was that the shells needed to go through a meter of steel armor plate, or seven meters of reinforced concrete, from a significant distance to prevent compromising said weapon. Krupp engineer Eric Muller was put in charge of the project, and his estimates led him to the conclusion that this new weapon needed to be bigger and stronger than anything built before. Muller's calculations established that his team needed to create an 80-centimeter caliber cannon capable of firing a 7-ton projectile from a 30-meter long barrel. He expected the weapon to weigh over a 1,000 tons, which meant moving and handling it would be a challenge. The Krupp team proposed twin sets of railway tracks to facilitate the movement of the cannon. Similar to smaller railway guns, the mount itself would only move the barrel up or down. Targeting the weapon would mean moving it along a curve in the railway line. They made plans for different calibers between 85 centimeters and 1 meter, presented in proposal to the Oberkommando des Heeres. Although traditional German weapons manufacturing practices meant that Krupp offered to make the first of these guns for free, with a price tag only added if more were required, the OKH made no official commitment to obtaining it. The project was on standby until Hitler visited Essen in March of 1936 and asked about the feasibility of building the massive cannon. After talks with Krupp, they began working on the design of an 80 centimeter caliber model. The plans were formalized and development began in early 1937. Production on the Schwerer Gustav commenced halfway through 1937. Although 1940 was set as a completion date, logistical issues with producing the massive sheets of steel needed pushed the date back. A test model was ready in late 1939, which Krupp sent to Hillesleben for testing. During the test, the guns were able to penetrate the meter of armor plate and the seven meters of concrete with a single shot from high elevation. Testing was completed in 1940, by which time the carriage had undergone several modifications. Hitler and Alfred Krupp met at Rugenwalde Proving Ground in 1941 for confirmation of the Schwerer Gustav's capabilities. The Oberkommando das Heeres placed an order for two of these cannons. The first commissioned gun was fired for the first time on September 10th from a makeshift carriage. It was then tested in Poland using the 7100 kilogram shell 
at a distance of 122,080 feet from the target. The Schwerer Gustav was an impressive weapon. The barrel was more than 100 feet long, longer than any other gun barrel at the time, and its body was bigger than any Allied or Axis tank. The gun was mounted on a chassis with eight bogies that had to be transported along two parallel railway tracks. The bogies gave the gun a total of 80 wheels. The shells themselves were taller than two soldiers stacked on top of each other, and weighed an intimidating 20,000 pounds. While this was necessary to pierce the barriers of the Maginot Line, it meant that multiple soldiers had to be involved in loading the Schwerer Gustav. The first gun was free for the German army. The second one commissioned along with it had a price tag of 7 million Reichsmark. The huge new German cannon was not ready by the time Hitler needed to break the Maginot Line, so his army had to take France without using it. Despite his previous belief that an extraordinary weapon would be needed for that conflict, the Germans took over France with relative ease, because the German troops overwhelmed the defensive troops. Even though the original goal of the Schwerer Gustav had been accomplished without it, Hitler still wanted his new toy to be used in the battlefield. He saw the siege of Sevastopol as an opportunity to use it and display its grandeur before his enemies. The heavy artillery unit E-672 was sent to Crimea along with the railway gun. The train carrying the weapon itself was 25 cars. In early March, the train reached the Isthmus of Perikop, where it waited until April while the special railway for the gun was built. In April, the Schwerer Gustav was placed on the new tracks, going from Simferopol to Sevastopol. The gun was successfully used at the siege, its first time in combat. It took five weeks to get it into firing position, with input and assistance from 4,000 people. It began shooting on June 5th, with 500 soldiers participating in the firing process. By the time Sevastopol fell on July 4th, the city had been destroyed. The Schwerer Gustav had fired 48 rounds. It shot at several valuable targets, including a munitions depot 98 feet underground that collapsed due to the shot. The barrel ended up in a precarious state due to its continuous use since testing. It was sent back to Essen, and the gun received a spare barrel that had been kept in the train. Soon after the battle was won, the huge railway cannon was dismantled so it could be transported. The German army had it sent to the north of the Eastern Front so it could be used against Leningrad in a planned attack. The Schwerer Gustav spent the winter near the Soviet city. Before it could be used again, the attack was called off. Three additional versions were either built or planned after the design of the Schwerer Gustav. The second gun produced, and the only other one used in battle, was named Dora, after Eric Müller's wife. It cost 7 million Reichsmark, equivalent to 24 million US dollars in 2015. Dora was deployed to the west of Stalingrad halfway through August in 1942, but was not ready for combat until September 13th. Since the Soviets were about to encircle the Germans soon after, the German troops decided to retreat, taking the powerful weapon with them. The Langer Gustav was a second-generation cannon that was destroyed by British bombings over Essen while it was under construction. The gun would have had a 52-centimeter caliber and a 43-meter long barrel. Its shells weighed 1,500 pounds and could shoot from 118 miles away. This meant that the Germans could have shot at London all the way from Calais in France. The third cannon was designed as part of a 1,500-ton self-propelled tank. The Landkreuzer P-1500 Monster was supposed to carry an 80-centimeter caliber gun, two heavy howitzers, and MG-151 autocannons to target aircraft. While some reports claim that the project was cancelled by Albert Speer before a prototype was made, others have claimed that the lack of evidence pointing at the development of this tank was just an urban myth. If it were real, and it had been built, the tank would have been 500 tons heavier than the heaviest tank ever built, 
the Panzer VIII Maus. After only limited use in the battlefield, the German army realized just how complicated it was to operate the Schwerer Gustav. One of the main problems was the huge number of soldiers needed to fire each round of ammo. This meant that all those soldiers would be focused on single shots, rather than playing multiple roles on the front. 2,000 people were needed to fire the Gustav cannon, the majority of them providing air cover rather than operating it. Additionally, assembling the five parts of the cannon would take around four days. Transporting the gun similarly required multiple days and several troops to avoid having the huge railway weapon being hit by a plane. Since movement was limited to specially designed tracks, difficult terrain made it impossible for transport, and the rails made it easy for allies to predict German positions. Another major issue with Spirer Gustav was the rate of fire. Since calibrating the cannon required several hours, it could only shoot about 14 rounds per day. The last nail in the Schwerer Gustav's coffin was the high cost of producing its shells, which had to be deprioritized with the deeply invaded Germany and high demand for tanks. The Third Reich's army eventually decided to retire Schwerer Gustav for the last days of the war. By April 14, 1945, the Soviet Union's Vienna offensive had been successful, and it was evident that American troops would soon be taking over the country. That same day, the leadership in charge of Schwerer Gustav decided to dismantle the cannon to prevent the Allied forces from capturing and using it. The weapon's ruins were found on April 22nd in a forest area near Auerbach and Chemnitz. After being studied by Soviet weapon specialists, it was sent to Merseburg and subsequently lost. Dora was destroyed on April 19th, and the ruins were discovered by American troops. Today, part of those ruins are housed in the Dresden Military History Museum of the Bundeswehr. <laughs> 